Thanks for coming here today for the first weekend brunch talk. And uh, I'm privileged to say both artists are here today um, to talk about their work. And, you know, they're both very different international artists and two very different international shows, in fact. Um, so starting over the road, Christian's show, Heavyweight History, actually took place in Poland where he invited a team of national weightlifters to hold aloft a number of famous or neglected monuments in Warsaw city center with varying degrees of success. And then his show also travels to uh, the fake oil painting village called Dafen in China where Christian also invited um, this time a group of artists to populate an unfinished museum with their own ideas of masterpieces. And finally, we also take in the famous boulevard of Las Ramblas in Barcelona, where Christian discovered his living statues. So please go across the road to visit that. And then here, when we finish back on this wall, is Wales film, and Wales show is called Dictums. And we start here in the deserts near Abu Dhabi, where uh, a group of priceless rare breed black camels pad silently across the desert, um, perhaps representing a flow of wealth, ideas, or people, or maybe it's just that they're traveling to this famous camel beauty contest, Al Dafra, near Abu Dhabi. And then into the next room, we move to Sharjah, where Whale invited a um, group of workers to sing a text that he devised as a song with two Sufi singers from Karachi. And indeed, in the final rooms, we end up on the pavements of Pakistan in the final room with these tarmac works, including aluminium plaques taken from the kinds of uh, delivery trucks that he found there. And just before we start properly, I'd like to play um, a couple of films, partly because they were the first films I saw of both artists and they're, they're early, some of the earliest films they made and might help highlight some of the differences or similarities even in their work. So, could we play Cave? And we'll start with The Hunt, maybe, which is Christian's work from 2002 on the left. And the next piece is The Cave by Well Shawky from 2005. <laughs> ماكثين فيه أبدا وينذر الذين قالوا اتخذ الله ولدا ما لهم به من علم ولا لآبائهم كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم إن يقولون إلا كذبا فلعلك باخع نفسك على آثارهم إن لم يؤمنوا بهذا الحديث أسفا إنا جعلنا ما على الأرض زينة لها لنبلوهم أيهم أحسن عملا وإنا لجاعلون ما عليها صعيدا جرزا أم حسبت أن أصحاب الكهف والرقيم كانوا من آياتنا عجبا إذ أول الفتية إلى الكهف فقالوا ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا فضربنا على آذانهم في الكهف سنين عددا ثم بعثناهم لنعلم أي الحزبين أحصى لما لبثوا أمدا نحن نقص عليك نبأهم بالحق 
إنهم فتية آمنوا بربهم وزدناهم هدى وربطنا على قلوبهم إذ قاموا فقالوا ربنا رب السماوات والأرض لن ندعو من دونه إلها لقد قلنا إذا شططا هؤلاء قوم اتخذوا من دونه آلهة لولا يأتون عليهم بسلطان بين فمن أظلم ممن افترى على الله كذبا وإذا اعتزلتموهم وما يعبدون إلا الله فأووا إلى الكهف ينشر لكم ربكم من رحمته ويهيئ Great, thanks. So, um, coincidentally, both, I think, early films filmed in the supermarket. I don't know if that says anything about either of them, but um, it does show that somehow that you both have a different relationship to filmmaking. You, I, I consider you both as filmmakers. You obviously make sculptures and paintings and many other things. But what is it about your relationship to filmmaking is it is it more to do with your relationship to television i mean both of these pieces and some of your work especially responds specifically to the te televisual medium rather than the film is that something that you you explore as a theme or i think that uh, the the per performance part is always uh, the main driven element in it uh, it all started with the idea of going Going for a hunt and going maybe in, in some some parks and and hunting animals in the park, but then I I, I trained myself in the kitchen and I, I shot on products just to get ready for the rabbits. Uh, I shot into um, you know other products and suddenly I had this thing in my hand which uh, and I thought this is much better than a rabbit, so let's go into the supermarket and so it all developed much more not from the filmmaking idea to present something in front of the camera, but it was more about the experience to, you know, to do a performance in, in, in another environment, in another environment that also informs the performance. And uh, thinking about that uh, the, the cashier, the woman in the end that drinks everybody, everything up, she was not aware of that performance. And uh, having her as a participant in that performance is something that um, is here for the first time in my work really present that somebody is active in you know also creating meaning for for uh, for, for the piece and because it would be entirely different if I would just steal the products and run out of the supermarket but you know by being caught by the system again that you really rang up and you have to pay for all of that um, for me it's a very important element and so of course Whenever you do the performance, more and more, the, the more often you do performance, you might be unhappy with the way how they're represented or how they're documented, and then this becomes more and more important. You know, mm -hmm. that first you ask a friend, and this friend never held a video camera, and then he makes a lot of mistakes, and you're not so happy with the material, and suddenly then you think, oh, somebody who can film can maybe do it better, and then suddenly you think, oh, if you pay somebody else to uh, represent and film your performance, you also kind of give him a vision. And maybe it's more interesting sometimes to be also in completely independent uh, structures of image production. Like for example, when you go into a TV show, m most of the things are out of your hands. Mm -hmm. Nobody will listen to the artist and say, oh no, put the light over there and please uh, ask me only this question in a talk, talk show. So also to go later on in, you know, the. the the places where this kind of productions take place and lose a bit more about the control, but by losing more control, getting more content from the other side into this form of dialogue, performative dialogue, that became something that was more and more interesting in the long run for me. Well, you did that. Um, over the road, we have the film, The Crying of the March of Humanity, which is where um, Christian invited um, this Mexican soap opera to recreate an, an entire episode, but in place of the dialogue, they were instructed to cry. Same, same scene, same acting. <laughs> this struck me about something you said well the other day that you, in your films, you, you talked about trying to somehow lessen the drama or take out the drama 
-hmm. And in that particular instance, Christian has kind of heightened the drama to the mm -hmm. maximum effect. But when you talked about sort of taking out the drama, what, what does that mean? What, you talked about it in relation yeah. to some of your films with, done mm -hmm. with children as actors, but mm -hmm. why, why take out the drama? Uh, well, okay, I think I hate acting. I hate, uh, I hate to depend on the skill of the actor. I think it's very, very, I'm, very, I'm really sensitive to this part. And also because most of the work that I'm interested in deals with the idea of a society in transition. Transition, maybe it's in transition from, uh, from one system to a higher. And this higher, maybe it's just a dream. It's a, it's a society that it's dreaming that it's in, in, in a development. Even if it's from nomadism to agricultural society or from agricultural society to urbanism. I think sometimes because these topics are, are very complex, I don't want to add to it more drama. And I also don't want to add to it also a layer of, uh, a, a gender layer, for example. And that's why I work with kids a lot. I think with kids, you don't see man, woman, which is very important also in many of my work. And uh, when I work with marionette as well, it's, a, it's the same idea, of course. You don't see this um, gender layer at all. And at the same time, you don't, you don't depend on the skill of act of the actor itself. You, you just have the, the, the text itself and the content uh, can, can present the value of the work, can, can be the, the, uh, the most important, basically. Uh, so yeah, most of the layers that I put, I think, in, in my work that has to do with this idea of, of um, killing drama. Even, I think, in this early work, it was part of it. It's, uh, it's uh, I mean, even if I go back to your, to your earlier question about uh, the, the using of, of cinema of t or TV, I think I tried to use cinema uh, or TV language in my work and not the opposite. I, I mean, I'm not very comfortable in, in showing my work inside the context of cinema, for example. I'm not very comfortable with this, but I'm comfortable with the opposite. And I think this work was because I was, I was in, in, uh, invited for a residency in, in, in Istanbul for about maybe eight months. And during that time, I was reading a lot in, in, in Sufism and, uh, uh, and it, 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 Turkey during that time also was in um, trying to be part of the European <laughs> Union. So it was a lot of conflict, political conflict in the street between people who are trying to keep Turkey as Islamic country and the other people that are trying to grab Turkey toward Europe, more toward Europe, between secular and, and, and religious, basically. So after this eight months, I was trying really to make a self-portrait. So this is for me more, more, than, more, more like a self-portrait, actually, as a, a, an artist, or, uh, as a Muslim artist, who is really traveling in this international context. So it's uh, basically the, the, uh, the supermarket becoming like the metaphor for uh, this cosmopolitan uh, international life that we live in. And, and it also, it's at the same time, it's, uh, uh, it's parallel to my experience in Istanbul and this uh, conflict between secular and uh, but I, 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 last thing, okay. yeah. the last thing that I was trying to say that my, my performance here is completely neutral, again to kill drama, to not to show any side, not to be with any side, not to be with, uh, uh, you, you, you won't be able to, to, to read my position basically. And you both collaborate with different types of people in your work. And you mentioned uh, before about somehow giving over control. And you've worked with child, uh, child actors or children before in your work. And you know, here mm -hmm. across the road we have uh, you know, these professional weightlifters, we have painters, we have actors. And you, you sort of hand over somehow the responsibility of 
making the work often to them. And why does that appeal to you? Is that to take yourself out of it, or what do you enjoy about that process of collaborating? Um, I, I enjoy this uh, different perspectives, and I enjoy um, also surprising myself partly by the outcome. Of course, like the main structure, um, I would not say I give away that they do all of the work. They do parts of the yeah. work, and, but I'm always the person who initiates mm -hmm. this kind of either conflict or, I mean, I'm not talking now so bad about the drama. There's something about the drama that I also think is important in art, mm -hmm. something dramatic. Uh, I mean, I completely uh, agree with, uh, or I feel very um, um, related to what Well said about actors, but out of a similar reason, because for an actor, um, you know, he wants to represent something he already knows earlier about what it is he represents. Mm -hmm. And in the performance, where you meet yourself almost, almost, ideally, on eye level, which of course hardly never exactly happens on eye level if there's the artist giving the structure, but sometimes I jump into it and try to act in it also on eye level. Um, and by that then, you mean on an equal platform that you're all working yeah, together. It doesn't exactly feel that. like you're ordering someone around or yeah. telling them what to and, do. Right. And I'm also, of course, the representation of myself is then also influenced by the other mm. person. You know, if you cannot exactly control, I cannot control the question you give me next. But you can lead me in a certain way or yeah. we can work together on it. Yeah. Yes. So it's more about, because sometimes when we say collaboration, what you mean is the artist tells someone what to do and they go off and do it. But you mean that it is collaborative. Yeah. Really. And I mean, from my perspective, of course, my audience uh, is, uh, is the art world mainly yeah. and this is since I initiated and I bring it into galleries and museums um, it's, it's already there but then bring different worlds like the, from, from the Vatican to you know the, the sports uh, people or yeah. businessmen on board uh, and try to create something that maybe also speaks in their world and has a separate life in, in, in their uh, context, mm. context uh, because the for example, the heavyweight lifters, they were bringing the exhibition to the heavyweight uh, champion, world championship last year, which took place in Poland. So they feel um, that they also show their sports skills to other sportsmen, you know, yeah. by showing this. Or if, uh, you know, from holy artwork, uh, where the te televangelist shows this on Texas television as a ceremony, or uh, the karaoke works I produced for Korea that are playing in karaoke bars as something completely in, in their own right and not so connected to the art world they at have all. their own life afterwards. Yeah, and I think then this shows many times that people have also an original interest in this type of communication and, you know, that televangelist uses, uh, you know, my um, starting of the conversation to come up with a topic and spread his message and maybe reach a new audience to that. Mm -hmm. But I think this way of using each other and um, being used by another person, I think that is something uh, that, I, that I find extremely interesting. How does your collaboration tend to work? I mean, I might be reading into it, but you, you do run uh, your own kind of art school with workshops in Alexandria called Mass. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, say, for example, uh, with the dictums piece you did in Sharjah, where you invited these um, workers from Pakistan or India to do these workshops, did you feel like there was some sort of educational um, remit to that? Did it, did it feel like what you were already doing in Alexandria? Is it, is it your way of working to somehow have a, an open style of workshop? Or yeah. No, I think, I think it's completely different. Completely different. Uh, and in uh, the, the the school we have in Alexandria, it's mainly uh, it's uh, something just started uh, three years ago. And uh, it's uh, basically it's a program that we have to have it in, in Alexandria in Egypt because the basically the educational system in Egypt in general is collapsing for for a long time now, and we don't have any uh, real space that deal with contemporary art in Egypt, not just in Alexandria. 
um, there are some really uh, individual uh, places that trying just to, to, to put some effort, like uh, Townhouse Gallery or uh, uh, CIC in, in, in Cairo, and some maybe little uh, examples at the American University in, in Cairo also, but it's still not enough to create what we can call it even an art scene in Egypt. This is very, very difficult. All the, 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 the artists that happened to be successful in Egypt, I think it, they came out of their uh, own individual effort and mm -hmm. experience and connections and all of that. Um, so we, we're, we're trying to build part of this social, of course, uh, infrastructure in, in, in Egypt mm -hmm. as much as we can. Mm -hmm. But what happened in, in, in Sharjah is something completely different, actually. I was invited to, um, uh, to, to give a comment, let's say, on uh, Sharjah Biennial in 2011. Uh, and they, they have something called the witness program where they invite an artist or a curator to give a comment or a lecture or a, a, an article about the Binali. And I, I decided to, when I went to this Binali, I decided that I will make a project, an artistic project about the Binali. So the topic will be the, the Sharjah Biennial as a little example of an art institution and the relationship between the art institution and the local community, the audience itself. What does it mean, this relationship? Since I see that the main point about the curators, we had three curators in this biennial, and the main point about the curators is breaking the gaps between contemporary art and the local community. Since Sharjah is a very particular example to this relationship, what does it mean exactly, the local community in Sharjah? Where most of the people that I meet in the street and the worker inside the foundations are coming from Pakistan and India. While the opening day, it's extremely international, um, fancy uh, uh, opening biennial, similar to any biennial we see in any place in the world, basically. And uh, where is the place for this local community, really, in this biennial? So this is what I was really interested to try to analyze. So it's not really criticism, although it's, it's, uh, the whole project was like a curatorial, um, a, an institutional critique, but at the same time it was more like analysis. In order for me to make this analysis, I made almost the, the, the opposite. I decided to give all the authority to the workers inside the foundation, inside these type of workshops. We made workshops for almost two, e two years, and within these workshops, I decided to work even with my ignorance, my own ignorance. So I decided to make all the press conference translated in Urdu, and they have all the, the, conversa the conversations between them in Urdu, and they select cer certain phrases from the press conference to make a poem. And this is the poem that you have, we have here, that it's uh, really we made a song out of it but uh, it was uh, not educational from my side. It was, it was almost the opposite, that I tried to give them the authority and the voice in this project completely. And they choose even the type of music that we ended up uh, recording in, in Pakistan. So in, uh, with voting, they decided in the end that most of them liked more the idea of Kawali music, which is religious music. So for me to combine this religious music with the press conference w was making complete sense because it's also talking about this curatorial discourse and how we deal with it as something, something sacred. But, but I really, did, I don't consider myself that I created this idea. I think it was more from their side, mm -hmm. basically. Well, after institutional critique, <coughs> I'd like to rattle through another couple of simple topics like um, Marxism and capitalism. And looking at your work across the road, these studies for the bourgeois working class, can you explain a bit about how that works? Studies for the monument. Studies for the of monument. Of the bourgeois working class, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. you have these images of um, a drill bit that you found in Mexico mm -hmm. um, I was well, in, at the Siqueiros yeah, I was in, in, invited to a once Stalinist home. Because, I, I mean, Siqueiros is like one of these 
muralist that was with, with Diego Rivera and Orozco and so on, like very political involved. Mm -hmm. and, and now they transformed his older studio and uh, living space into a museum that's named after him. And you still have some of the murals which he had also around in his living and working space. They also still exist there. And so somehow this context was drove me into communism, Stalinism, because um, looking at his work and uh, imagining having work in there, I, you know, I, some thoughts came up about the purpose of this you know, murals where you think um, an audience that cannot really read, but they can look and they have this feeling that they want to um, educate an audience with this, uh, uh, of course, very political, um, opinionated visions. Uh, so then I thought, you know, maybe the new m murals are telenovelas that drove me into the whole telenovela section. Mm -hmm. Because also if you look into Latin America, you see how also telenovelas really are used as political instruments. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I copied part of his title for the title that I took for the video. But you referred to another photographic work, which in the archive of Siqueiros, I found very funny and, and also very interesting black and white photos that was, were the ones that he used to make the huge murals, because it's almost looking from photography to make the enlargements on the walls. And um, there was a picture of a drill bit that was held in a very beautifully manicured woman's hand. And so I saw on one side the working class symbol being held by a complete bourgeois, never ever worked with his hands on, uh, beautiful jewelry, beautiful jewelry uh, on the hand. Uh, and I thought this kind of discrepancy, and I'm not really judging now Siqueiros, mm -hmm. but uh, it's something you find also in, uh, in in, by making art and in the artist, you know, this kind of thing, being so engaged in Stalinism that you're going to kill Trotsky and give the Lenin Peace Prize to North Vietnam to fight the <laughs> Americans, uh, you know, but also living in the fanciest part of Mexico City next to Hollywood actors, and you have no problem to support your biggest mural by the biggest capitalist and industrial guy from Mexico. I mean, this is a very you know, conflicted position, which uh, I just found also with this kind of historical distance, music, amusing and interesting, but also interesting. So it's just a symbol that stands for other things. That's why I think it's a monument for the you know, bourgeois working class. I made this hand with a drill bit. You made it in, as a giant sculpture, didn't you? A, sort of yeah, more sculpt. like you know, socialist, realist sculpture uh, that you also find in Mexico City. So that's, that's the story behind that. I was. Well, it was also interesting your, your, the way that you worked with the heavyweight history was a lot of the, the monuments that you proposed to um, interact with are controversial for being kind of remnants from the communist era. And in Poland, you know, they are, you know, some of them are controversial because they don't necessarily either want you to draw attention to them or they're not sure if they want them on yeah. display anymore. Historia wagi ciężkiej Michał Olszański, FM1. Zapraszam na kolejne wydarzenie artystyczno-historyczno-sportowe. Grupa znakomitych e, atletów, reprezentantów trójboju siłowego i podnoszenia ciężarów zmierzy się już za chwilę z pomnikiem Ronalda Regana. To jeden z najmłodszych pomników w Warszawie, ale stojący w jakże ważnym miejscu vis-a-vis -vis ambasady amerykańskiej. Odsłonięty tutaj przez Lecha Wałęsę, jakżeż to było symboliczne. Ronald Reagan, prezydent Stanów Zjednoczonych, legendarny, który doprowadził do upadku Związku Radzieckiego. Właśnie z trybuny, przemawiając przed Białym Domem, zwracał się panie prezydencie do Michała Gorbaczowa. Czas, by mur berliński runął. I teraz nasi atleci spróbują podnieść Ronalda Reagana, ale to jest historia najcięższej wagi. Ronald Reagan, który tutaj osadzony na takim bardzo mocnym postumencie, trzyma się tak jak trzymał się w czasie żelaznej kurtyny. Oni w tej chwili są już przy pomniku. Ale jest śliski, nie udało się przy pierwszym podejściu, nie udało się, tak jak i Rosjanom, nie udało się nic zrobić, by zatrzymać Ronalda Regana. A oni próbują... Za moment...
ale nie udało się. Nie udało się, bo są po prostu nie są w stanie ruszyć tego pomnika. Ronald Reagan niczym skała stoi na swoim miejscu i tak jak to było w czasie, kiedy jeszcze żył, jeszcze spróbują, jeszcze raz spróbują podejść, ale tam nie za bardzo jest za co skłycić. Oni mają swoje rekordy wyśrubowane, ale tutaj nie chodzi o kilogramy. Tu chodzi o stabilność i o to, że Ronald Reagan jest nie do ruszenia. Nie są w stanie, nie mogą, przegrywają z potęgą Ronalda Reagana. Historia waży w tym momencie niezwykle. To dobrze, że Ronald Reagan jest nie do ruszenia. Prawda? Bardzo dobrze. Bardzo dobrze. Ronald Reagan tym razem nie do ruszenia. Trudno, nasi znakomici sportowcy musieli odejść z pomnika z poczuciem przegranej, ale tak naprawdę to nie jest przegrane. So for me I try to get looking at the piece that for Warsaw was I just looked into this history of the monuments as something that you can just more purely describe how heavy why was it done who made it and so on so the basic facts about the monuments as sculptures and on the other hand the uh, famous sports commentator he knew the sports people yeah and he he also knows something about how to cover a sport event and for me i think the kind of hope that i had where something new would occur <coughs> is in this mingling of these two worlds that you, you, you say on one hand, oh, he's very slippery, uh, you know, um, you, you cannot... Uh, can't lift up Ronald you can't, Reagan. You cannot li lift Ronald Reagan because he's so slippery. Yeah. yeah, on the other hand... That came out of the commentator just Right, playing, right. Know. Or, you, you know, you, you give some uh, information... Some truth comes from that, yeah. About, about the um, Varinsky, who was founder of the Communist Party there in Poland, and um you know getting this just in this in 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 this style of the sports commentator who talks very fast just as a side sentence he says oh yeah who actually died in a russian concentration camp in the age of 32 on tuberculosis and then jumps back into the reality of 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 the sports yeah. and i think this kind of flipping between the two worlds and the the two you know um um sent it's uh, maybe you're not sensitive, you know, because many times, especially when, when we handle this fragile and very um, uh, painful history, you, you choose your words very, very carefully. And um, in that moment, to bring it with the sports, with a thing that happens for a few seconds and then it's down, you forget about certain awareness where you think, oh, what is my other partner thinking about if I'm now saying this? So it's much more immediate and I think that was something that helped uh, to look a little bit different on, on this. I wondered whether, I mean, it's a sort of the, the old saying is that, that art, we were talking about artists and sort of intervening in history somehow or recreating history, but mm -hmm. do you believe that in any way art can change things or can change politics or can have, can really have an effect? Or do you believe that it has a different purpose? Mm. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, obviously yeah. the recent kind of revolutions we've seen in the Middle East or in, yeah. in the Far East. Do you feel like art can have a role in that sort of change? Yeah, I'm, okay, I, on, honestly, I, uh, this is really important because I think, for example, since the, the revolution started in Egypt, which is, of course, I think we are in the, in, in the progress now. There is nothing really has changed, and, but anyway, I decided not to, to reflect into this at all. And I really believe that this is not the role of the artist, personally. I don't think that this is the role of the artist. I don't think the artists need to be reactionary toward changeable events like this. So you, to, for, for one day you will be, for example, celebrating the army, the second day the army will cheat on you. So what will you do? That means the art will be depending on this uh, changeable events, and I don't really, I think the artist has much, much higher role than this, and art has a higher role than this. Um, I started Cabaret Crusade series before all the revolution happened, uh, in like a year before the revolution actually, and it just happened that it became sort of um, a reflection to current events, but it was not meant to be this from the beginning, really. It was, it was the Crusades' history, but at the same time, it's just like really you see a lot of similarities happening between uh, what is happening today in Syria 
and 1,000 years ago in Syria. It just happened this way. But I did not mean this. I really did not really want to, this uh, to, to appear. The, 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 the second part of Cabaret Crusades is dealing more with the idea of the relationship between the Arab or Muslim leaders between each other during the establishment of the Crusades in the Middle East already and all of the cheatings that are happening between them and each other. And this is, I think, it's, it's very important. And the, while the first part of Cabaret Crusades is dealing more with the, uh, the cheating that came from the Crusaders and the invasion that happened in the Middle East. And I think this is, this is the differences. But uh, yeah, this is... Uh, for example, I th I, 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 when, when I talk about the, the, the current part of Cabaret Crusades that I'm working on, it's also a big research and it's very difficult and very sensitive. It's called Cabaret Crusades, The Secrets of Karbala. Most of you know about Karbala. Karbala is the city in Iraq where a big, big massacre happened after the, the, the death of the Prophet Muhammad, a massacre between two sects of Muslims. And this main battle that happened, this massacre that happened, led into a big split in the Muslim community in general till now, that to happen that it became Sunnah and Shia. So this conflict is not really visible yet. I don't know if it will be visible in the future, but it, I'm, I'm just trying to say that I'm working on this project now, but not because I, I see that this is the current events that are happening. In Iraq today, of course, there is a conflict between Sunnah and Shia. This is something really exists, but it's not existing in Egypt yet, yet. But most of the events that are happening in my film now in Cabaret Crusades, the third part, are happening during the period when Egypt was already ruled by the Fatimid period, which is the Shia, let's say that it's, it's sort of a Shia, uh, uh, system. And Salah al-Din will, will come from Syria to Egypt and will turn Egypt into Sunnah. And after this turning point, the, he, they will be able to capture back Jerusalem. So I'm just trying to connect between two different complete time in history. The time of, Cabri, uh, of, of, uh, of the Crusades, starting from 1,146, and the time in the, this battle in Karbala that goes back to, to more than, than 500 years before that time. That's um, I'm going to open the floor to questions to, to the artists in a minute, but I might just ask you, Christian, whether you can respond to that. How you see the role of the artist? Is it as a creator or uh, a connector or kind of interventionist or... Where do you see your role being? You know, we talked about collaboration. We talked yeah. about ways of, you know, reinventing old. Yeah, I think that, you know, in in a way, earlier the question to where was kind kind of can you change? Can art change the world mm -hmm. and so on? And I would say yes, but you know, not in a way that you say I want to reach this like propaganda or advertisement where you exactly know where you want your audience to go mm -hmm. you know I think that's why I'm involving two worlds because if you get this balance right that you think is this about sport or dealing with history if you talk about other works between religion and and art you know mm -hmm. is this blasphemic or is this supportive of a religion um, you know I think if, if, if you um, if you in my hand what I try to reach Kind of get a kind of balance and have this up to the audience to make a decision and because that's in the moment where you can maybe not change your audience but or change the thoughts of the audience but they the audience changes itself itself mm -hmm. into a position that they want or that speaks to them and i think that's that's already a bit of changing the world no yeah great few people's lives, it's failed. Yeah, I agree. Have we got any questions for our artists? If you want to put your hand up, or have you got anything pressing? Yeah, in the front here. I have a question.
question for Christian because watching the video this morning, I noticed the strong framework that you have with the TV show, actually the news show. And I was thinking that most of us actually experienced uh, the 1989 and 1990s revolutions from Eastern Europe and the fall of the Berlin War from television. It was a very strong experience even for us who were very young at the time. And we still have those images of the fall of the wall, of even like those really big statues that were falling. It was a symbolic right. fall. Mm -hmm. Just thinking, what does mass media play in your um, work? I think that it it already speaks about a collective view that has, um, you know, that speaks a kind of language that we all think we know and understand. And I think that, um, you know, of course you could have taken the sports moderator out and just do it with the heavyweight lifters. You talk about the heavyweight history video, no? Yeah. yeah. So, of course, you, you could take that out, but I felt that always taking these performances into, into formats of the, of the media even gave a new layer to it. I think still the, the, you have the option to just read it as a conceptual or like a performance piece in public space because it happened as performances. People were going to the center square of Warsaw, saw, uh, the, they saw the symbol of Warsaw, the mermaid being lifted up. Just by accident, one Saturday morning, they walked by and saw this happen. Uh, but on the other hand, when you, start to, when you start to document something like that, you easily come into a moment where you have to make decisions. Now, do I do this? How do I arrange this? Is this now black and white? Is this color? Uh, you start to become uh, um, somebody who <coughs> gives a certain style to it. And I think that, that I rather say, it's about real professional sportsmen, and with sportsmen comes a certain way to document sportsmen. I just take it, and it's not my decision. I don't say I'm responsible for bringing six different perspectives to each monument, because that's how you have weightlifters on an Olympic. They do it with three different, six different angles, from like a sports camera, that you can quickly zap from one perspective to the next. Now, if I start dolly shots and make it like something like this, it, immediately gives another thing to it. And since it was a real sport event, they just hold it up for a few seconds, if they even could hold it up. I work similar like sports, because if you do the World Championship there, you also have a few seconds to get the shot. And that's why I use you know, this, uh, this mass media format, because I think it serves perfectly for this kind of genre. Uh, any other questions? Yeah? I'm interested to know whether, how you see the relationship between art and propaganda and whether you can ultimately make that distinction. Mm -hmm. No, but the point is also so boring, you know, it's in the moment when you, if, if, no, no, but as, even as an artist, if you think as your practice, you already know before you meet or talk to somebody, before you turn on your camera, you even know your message. How boring is that? Sure. So, I mean, I think it's great to have an experience on both ends. That means also that uh, potentially your perspective about a certain topic can also change, at least as an option. And you take that completely away when you say, I want to reach that point. And that's for me like advertisement or product propaganda. And uh, I want to address that to you well as well, because with this piece here, the piece about the camels, you've left it very open, whereas previously you've done more work, let's say, you'll, you'll overlay it with a text or a narrative. But here, that it's, a, it's a silent film. There is much less kind of context for it. Is that something that you are constantly kind of looking it, for different ways to change? You're not sort of working in yes, series like that? Yes, different series, yeah. Well, actually, this series is also different because for the moment, I'm working with three different series, that's true. One is uh, the Cabaret Crusades, it deals more with history uh, and the way we believe in history, basically. And uh, another piece called Al Arab Al Madfuna, that is also part of it shown in, in Serpentine, that deals with the relationship between literature and uh, uh, daily life, 
basically it's, it deals more with the idea of of the uh, of of metaphysics and materialistic daily life. Uh, and this uh, project is a bit different. It's, 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 another, it's the, th the third series I'm working on that I consider that uh, this piece is only one element of this, uh, of this series. And I was really trying to, uh, uh, to not to, 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 to have as you said, maybe it's an open end, but at the same time, it's, it was very important to, to make it clear that this is only about that we are watching beauty, basic beauty, even though this is sort of a uh, cliche uh, for, let's say, for the, 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 the Western uh, audience about the, the East, for example, which is, which is, of course, something like really uh, I'm always trying to play with, but this is, uh, for me, it was, uh, it was more to have it silent for, uh, uh, to make it also very uh, concentrated on the idea of beauty, rarity, nomadism, all these uh, uh, topics that I'm dealing with in this series, Dictums. I think it would be even more clear if, and inshallah, we, I continue this series and this will be shown as part of it. I also like that, that you said that you'd actually seen almost like a, a rolling news channel in one yes. of your hotels where they just had yes. processions of the camels yes. with music and kind of rolling text. Yes. That it was, they had their own dedicated yeah, news yeah, yeah. station. That's true, actually. It's, uh, it's really be, something really, really known in... Uh, in United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and this type of camels, they imported from Saudi Arabia, uh, not from Emirates, but I, I shot this in Emirates. Uh, and they use it mainly for what they call it, the mizaina, or sh sort of showing off. Beautiful. And, beautiful. and uh, what? Beautiful, beautiful. Beaut beautiful, yeah. yes. Mizaina, yes. Mizaina. Uh, and the idea here also has to do with uh, uh, they, they are very expensive, of course, but these black camels, they don't use them for racing, for example, for race. They use them more for only this type of showing off and maybe for milking purposes, but that's it. There's, there's no other reason for that. Uh, and yes, that some, there are some TV channels in Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates that are only showing camels in the desert. But, but to be honest, they have also with it sort of uh, poems. Mm -hmm. That poems that are made specifically to celebrate camels and to talk about the beauty of camels. Seriously, it's like 24 hours channels just for camels, which is beautiful. I think it's, it's fantastic. And actually, I tried to make this type of poems. And when I went to Abu Dhabi, I, I found uh, uh, a poet. Uh, that is very specialized in this. And we made some work together, and I tried many different things, and in the end I decided not to use any of that, and I decided that it's, it had to be silent. All right, I think we'll wrap it up now, and um, I love the idea that we're all somehow chasing our own ignorance. <laughs> and we, we may not have proved that the artists are either particularly similar or particularly different, but um, I hope we can agree that both their work has a wider relevance and perhaps the ability or the power uh, to affect our view of our world and how we live. So thanks to the artists and um, just give them a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>